This is Financial Standard, the definitive source of news, thought leadership and analysis for Australian wealth management professionals. Financial Standard. Take the lead. I'm Cassandra Baldini with Financial Standard. Last week, the quality of advice review dropped, and since, there has been a fair amount of positive and negative feedback. Here with me to discuss this further is Association of Advisors Chief Executive Phil Anderson. Phil, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Cassie. It's good to be here. Well, let's just start with the most topical proposal, the big one, and that is non-relevant providers joining or rejoining the advice space. You noted that the outcome could be positive, with more Australians who are priced out of advice being able to receive simpler forms for less, but added controls were needed around the types of advice provided and said education standards had to be raised. Do you think if there are more controls in place, the industry won't go back to the days before the Royal Commission? Yeah, it's it's a this is a really hot issue. And as as you said, Cassie, uh, when we responded to the proposals paper, we said there was merit in this proposal, but subject to those controls, that the advice was limited to simple advice and um, the education standards were higher, significantly higher than just the basic RG146. And the reason why we thought that there was merit in this was simply because there are many Australians who can't get financial advice and they can't afford financial advice. So we're of the view that this was a proposal that was worthy of further consideration. And one way of thinking about it would be that if advisors can't provide all the advice needs for all Australians, then what is the alternative? And maybe for those advisors who are just fundamentally opposed to this, it might be worthwhile asking them the question that, Are you willing to take on all clients? Are you willing to make yourself available to give all clients advice, even if they can't afford to pay the fee that you believe your services warrant? That's why we've approached this from the perspective that it's something that we need to work through and we need to have a sensible solution on. Now, we would like to have seen the final report um, be be firmer on limiting the scope of this type of advice uh, to simple forms of advice and to uh, recommending higher education standards apply. Now, neither of those two things were in the final report uh, in that it was really limited to the licensees to determine what type of advice could be provided and what education standards should apply. So we do have um, ongoing concerns with this, but I would say uh, that we need to deal with this recommendation with a little bit of maturity. I mean, it, it doesn't need to be such a blunt message that no, you know, we refuse this. It can be a message that we believe that it has merit, um, but it has merit in very particular circumstances. Advisors are concerned um, that non-relevant providers will have more advice autonomy and play in the same space. You, you splag that was kind of unlikely. Whereas consumer groups have argued this will create a two-tier advice system where financial advisors continue servicing those who can't, who can afford it, where poor Australians are put at risk of receiving conflicted advice from super funds and banks. Do you agree that there will be a two-tier system going forward? I agree that there will be more than one tier, but I make the point that right now we have a three-tier system anyway. You have people who provide general advice, which involves a recommendation intended to influence someone to purchase a product. So it is advice 
that is uh, going to have uh, client consequences. So that already exists. And we also have people who operate in the wholesale only client space for which there is very few um, professional standards that apply. I mean, they don't have to provide statements of advice. They're not bound um, by the exam or the education standard or the best interest duty. So we already have really three tiers. Now, what Michelle is recommending is, is going to fundamentally limit the ability for general advice or something similar to that to exist in its current form in the future. So, and there are some significant consequences of this for product providers because they will be deemed to have information on the client. That means they uh, are forced to provide personal advice to existing clients as opposed to general advice. So yes, we will have more than one tier under this model. But I, I guess the, the, the pushback from advisors is probably centred around a, a few main fears. One is the loss of clients, which I think is highly unlikely because I think the clients who are going to leverage this type of service are not the same clients who are um, ongoing clients that are in the target market for financial advisors. You know, in some ways, we would look at, uh, at this from a uh, in, term, in terms of concentric circles, there would be very little overlap. So it's not a question of losing clients. The other concerns are, are things like unlevel playing field. And this, I, I think, one that really bites at advisors, how is it possible that other people could be allowed to operate in this space with reduced standards? But one thing that's relevant to them is that People who are non-relevant providers can't charge a fee for the advice that they provide. And I think the third fear is that there's going to be um, really poor advice that's provided as a result of this new tier or this new regulatory regime. And I think it's worthwhile pushing back on that in that there will still be, if it was implemented, a good advice duty and there will be other stringent obligations that apply to these um, providers. And to assume that, that they would just go into this um, with a complete lack of regard for that obligation that they would have under the good advice duty and, um, and that they would wreak broad-scale consumer detriment, I think is being a, a little bit excessive more than a little excessive in terms of the contemplation of the consequences. So I, I do think there, there are controls around this. I do think that this is a complex recommendation and it's one that's caused a lot of problem. But I think, A, it's being um, confronted with an unwillingness to compromise um, and, and a very um, aggressive response that is not necessarily based in reality. And I guess keeping in mind all that we've discussed, do you think the proposed reforms will actually make advice more affordable and accessible? Yes, I do. I mean, I, I would go through the, the things that will make a real difference. The removal of fee disclosure statements and the rationalisation of, of fee consent, I think, will have a very material impact. You know, there's a few hundred dollars involved in that each year. Uh, the removal of the mandatory requirement to produce advice doc documentation is also something that could have a material impact on the cost of providing advice. I think there are other things that will make uh, more um, marginal improvements, such as the recommendation around DDO reporting obligations, financial services guides. Uh, I think also the, the one around the new definition of a best interest duty and the removal of the obligation around the safe harbour steps, these can all have a, a pretty important impact on the cost of providing advice. So, yes, I believe we could see a substantial reduction in the cost of providing advice. 
the more detailed work really needs to be done to assess the quantum of it. But these are not immaterial recommendations. What about, you know, financial advisors? Do you think it's going to be a little bit harder for them to communicate their value now consumers can find cheaper forms of advice? I don't think this is such an issue about communicating value. Uh, I think that we get very positive feedback from the marketplace that clients do value the uh, the quality of the service that they get from their advisor. And when you look at it and you look at what real comprehensive advice is all about, there's three key elements. One is about the, getting the plan and having confidence that you have a plan that works. Secondly, it's about the emotional benefits. So it's about someone who genuinely understands you, has given advice that reflects your circumstances uh, and makes you feel positive about, uh, about your situation and gives you the emotional strength that you have a plan in place. And in, in a life insurance context, that's about confidence that should something happen, you and your family are protected. So that emotional response to advice is really important. And the third part of it is being able to achieve behavioural change. People who, who have access to advice have greater confidence, but they also have better financial behaviours and better financial decision making. They're not the ones who are sitting there um, with large sums of money paying interest at high credit card rates. They're not the ones ripping their money out of super um, when that's disadvantageous to them. They're the ones who, who are um, accessing advice, they are clear thinking, um, they are careful in large part on how they make decisions and uh, they're, they're better capable of saving uh, and they actually achieve better outcomes with the money they have invested. So, look, I, I think that, you know, when you look at all of those things that make up what a relationship with a financial advisor is all about, it's way above and beyond um, what will be delivered through some sort of transactional arrangement that might exist with a non-relevant provider. Uh, you know, they, these, are, these are interactions, these are transactions more than they are an ongoing relationship where there is uh, so much value that is demonstrated. I guess honing in on super funds there, most actually argue their clients expect them to provide advice, especially around retirement. Why do you think financial advisors feel strongly against this? Well, I think there's a couple of hot issues here. First of all, retirement advice is inevitably complex. And it's complex because you've got considerations around Centrelink, you've got considerations around tax, you've got long durations. So you know, people are in retirement for a long period of time. Invariably, it is complex advice that involves skills that are not only technical skills, but, but soft skills. There's a huge change that impacts someone's life when they go into retirement. It, you know, one of the things that we most underestimate is the personal and emotional considerations when you are uh, confronting retirement. And there's relationship issues. You know, there's, unfortunately, there's a, a trigger for divorce that happens as a result of retirement and, um, and people being put in situations that they, they're just not well suited to, to cover. Personal, personal advice provided by a financial advisor prepares people for the financial impact and also the um, emotional impact of retirement. And so that is something that should be done by someone who is appropriately qualified. It's not a transactional type advice uh, proposition. So 
that's why I think uh, advisors are, are uncomfortable about it. The other thing is is intra-fund advice. So the, the proposition that retirement advice could be provided through the mechanism of intra-fund advice is, is quite um, uncomfortable for advisors because of the charging me mechanism that sits behind intra-fund advice. Intra-fund advice through the CIS Act is defined in terms of advice that is provided through a, um, a charging mechanism where all the members pay for that service to be provided and it's not it's not used by everyone, it's used by a subset. And so they're not paying extra for intra-fund advice. It's coming out of their admin fee. And so advisors right, rightly are concerned about that as a mechanism undervaluing advice. There's no price put on it and therefore it doesn't appropriately value advice. So that's why I think we have real concerns about complex retirement advice being provided uh, through um, other mechanisms, whether that's non-relevant providers or even relevant providers through the intra-fund advice mechanism because uh, they don't necessarily have the right skills or they are doing it in a, in a way that undervalues the advice that is being provided. And super funds collectively charging has also been flagged as a bit of an issue. Can you explain why that is? Uh, there's always um, a level of discomfort with it amongst the advisor population for some of the reasons that I've already talked about, that if individuals do not pay specifically on a standalone basis for that advice and it's covered through uh, the admin fees paid by all members of the fund, then it's, it's seen as a, a way of um, working around all the other obligations that financial advisors have, uh, such as you know, fee disclosure statements and so on, um, but also it undervalues the the advice. It, it it doesn't put a price on it, so people don't appreciate how expensive it is to provide financial advice, and they don't necessarily value it. So when it comes to the consideration of of, of intra fund advice, the 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 recommendation in the quality advice review is that the scope that is able to be provided through interfund advice would be expanded. And so the concern is that why are we allowing um, a, a mechanism for charging that really seems more suitable for simple transactional type advice to be used for more complex advice? Well, one win for advisors is the removal of statement of advice. But is this a win for power planners? What kind of impact will it have on that community? Yeah, a, a good question because, I mean, people will view this as, as something that uh, in, has a broader impact than maybe it does in reality. I think all the work that needs to be done in preparing advice still needs to be done. I mean, the, the message in the QAR is that you need to have documentation on file to demonstrate that your advice um, is compliant. So all of that work still needs to be done. What is not necessarily needing to be done is the way that it is documented. And it may be that um, some advisors choose to stick with largely putting their advice in a documented form, but maybe it's um, it's not as uh, substantial or, or complex as currently is provided through statements of advice. So you might move more to a, um, a mechanism of articulating the advice through a letter and it being much shorter. So my point to, on this from a paraplanner perspective is that it may reduce the demand for some of the services that they provide. However, I anticipate that uh, it won't be anywhere near as substantial as some people may think because the advice process still needs to be worked through. It's only the end documentation that is being altered here 
and more than likely um, most advisors and probably many licensees will still want some form of advice documentation to be prepared, even though it will be a lot simpler and much more client-centric. And wrapping up, there will be a consultation period before the final report is released. How long do you think before we see that draft legislation? Uh, well, Cassie, I don't think we're we're in a situation now where all we have is the report itself and we don't know um, how the government will choose to respond to it. The suggestion is that there will be further consultation. So we would hope that before too long, we would actually see um, a final um, government proposal on how they're going to respond to the quality of advice review. Now, uh, that might still take a few more months. I mean, we we just don't know at this stage. We did hear um, earlier in January that the minister um, remains committed to uh, addressing the problem that he himself described as a hot mess in June last year. Uh, And he will will certainly be keen to be looking at at obvious wins. And maybe it it could play out that we could see some of the more obvious changes implemented more quickly. So we would definitely love to see the fee disclosure statement and fee consent form rationalisation treated as an absolute priority. That would be relatively simple to legislate for. And if that was uh, to to come early, and certainly um, early as a sign of commitment to dealing with the broader package, then that would really be warmly welcome. More broadly, you know, I think that as we talked about, rationalisation of advice documents, that's something that could be done, um, the the transition period would be easier, Uh, it, it it could be something that that, um, they could put up the priority list. Some of the more complex issues that I think will necessarily take somewhat longer to work through are things like um, a non-relevant provider recommendation, if that was to happen, Um, some of the changes around the best interest duty and the introduction of a good advice uh, obligation. You know, those sorts of things might take a little bit longer. So the the question here is, does the government choose to um, give us some some wins early on in the process, or do they intend to respond to this as a complete package, um, and do they want to go through a a long extended consultation process, in which case, you know, it could be later this year before we have any clear Uh, understanding of what the end outcome and legislation might be sometime in the next year. I personally hope um, that we get to see some material changes sooner rather than later. Um, And let's start with the removal of fee disclosure statements. Absolutely. Well, Phil, thank you so much for providing that clarity for industry and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Cassie. Thanks for listening to this Financial Standard podcast. For more information, visit financialstandard.com.au. Please keep in mind that the information discussed in this podcast is general in nature and does not consider personal circumstances. Reliance should not be placed on any content without further independent financial research and advice. 